All right, I think we'll get started now. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, just a, a note that we are going to be recording today's session and Brian, you can start that whenever you're ready. Um, this is our second meeting of the Whitehead Reading Group. We're so glad to have all of you here with us from around the country and around the world. My name is Brian Donaldson and I currently teach in philosophy and religious studies at the University of California, Irvine. Um, I explicitly moved to Claremont in order to study uh, process. In fact, I moved here before I was actually accepted. And then once the School of Theology had uh, offered its process PhD emphasis, um, I was able to transfer there and I finished in 2013. Uh, I engage Whitehead's work primarily in interdisciplinary fields of South Asian and Indian philosophies, applied ethics and critical animal studies. And I was just really looking for an opportunity to look at some of Whitehead's work with people who were uh, familiar with um, his writing over the decades. And so it was just a real joy to me that Brian and Joe were on board. And of course, that all of you have joined in as well. Um, taking in the feedback that we got from our last session, we have opted to record these sessions and they'll be available on the WRP website. And uh, we'll just keep getting feedback about every other session. And you'll see the dates for our next sessions here on the slide. And we'll give a recap of those, of course, before we finish. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Brian now for any announcements and just another reintroduction. Thanks, everyone. Morning, everybody. My name is Brian Henning. I'm a professor of philosophy at Gonzaga University in Northwestern United States. And I'm the executive uh, director of the Whitehead um, Research Projects, critical edition of Whitehead. I'm really happy to be with you here today and talk about uh, another newly uh, revealed piece, this one on religious psychology. I wanted to draw everybody's attention to, again, the, the fact that volume two of the critical edition just uh, came out uh, in the United States this month, in, the, in Europe last month. So if you haven't yet ordered it, um, now would be a good time. There's a 30% discount code that'll be available for a while longer. And the books are expensive to produce and, and expensive to buy. Um, I'd also ask if you are attached to a university library that you consider asking your university librarian to purchase a copy too, uh, showing that there's a healthy market for Whitehead research and scholarship is, is really important to keeping the critical edition project alive and keeping our friends at, at Edinburgh University Press happy. Uh, and so we'll be having, as you can see on that link in the chat, we'll be having a conference on the volume. What I'd encourage you to do is to, if you can, to get a copy, to read it, and think about um, submitting a proposal for that virtual conference that we'll be holding uh, this uh, late summer in September. A good idea would be to consider, for example, uh, getting the volume and then thinking about how it um, changes or doesn't change your view of Whitehead relative to other research projects that you've pursued in the past or are pursuing now. So how do these new materials relate to what you've already been doing is a, is a good um, go-to topic for that conference. So uh, that is uh, the main announcement I have, unless I'm forgetting something, uh, and I'll turn it over to Joe. Sorry, forgot to unmute. Uh, hello again. Uh, my name is Joe Pedick, and uh, strange to say, but I've been working with the Whitehead Research Project for eight years now. I'm the chief archivist and also the uh, assistant editor for the uh, critical edition. Um, and I, I thought, like last time, I would try to provide everyone with a little bit of context for today's reading. Uh, and as, as, as well as a few other observations about the content of it uh, to lead us off. Uh, but I'm going to be considerably briefer than last time in case you're wondering, partly because we just know a lot less about this address than we do about Whitehead's first Harvard lecture. So uh, getting right to it, there are actually a number of stars that had to sort of align in order for us to be able to identify the context of this address at all. The first star, so to speak, was a handwritten marginal note on page eight that says, insert picks two quotations. Uh, this is no doubt referring to Edward Pickman, who is a personal friend of Whitehead's at Harvard. And when I saw that note, uh, I actually remembered that I had previously cataloged a letter from Pickman to Whitehead, which was also donated with the rest of Whitehead's papers, 
uh, in which he was sending Whitehead a quotation. And when I went back and looked at that letter, lo and behold, Pickman is not only providing Whitehead a quotation directly, but also providing him a second one in a book of his called The Mind of Latin Christendom, which incidentally is freely available to download as a PDF on archive.org if you're interested in examining that further. I've got a, a link up on the website to it. And uh, just in case there's any doubt that these two quotations from Pickman are the ones Whitehead is referring to in his marginal note, I should point out that Whitehead actually has the phrase, the mind of Latin Christendom in quotes at the start of the second paragraph of his address. So it seems pretty evident that he had Pickman's book very much in mind when he wrote it. Um, and I do wanna read just a portion of one of these quotations that Pickman gave to Whitehead, which comes from a fourth century bishop named Hillary. Quote, the church who won believers by suffering exile and imprisonment now commands faith by threatening exile and imprisonment, unquote. Now, it seems pretty easy to see why Whitehead would have wanted to include that since it pretty well encapsulates the problem that he's driving at in this address. Uh, anyway, Pickman mentions in his letter that Whitehead might want to include these quotations in his paper that was, quote, read to the Augustinian Society. So with that bit of info, I was able to track down a few references to the address uh, one of them was in Victor Lowe's book, Understanding Whitehead, in which he actually gives us the exact date of the address, uh, March 30th, 1939, which coincidentally was right on the eve of World War II and uh, about two years after Whitehead's retirement from Harvard. Uh, the other place that this address gets mentioned is in a 1982 article in Process Studies by Paul Kuntz about whether Whitehead could be seen as a Christian philosopher. At one point in the article, he gives a really long, really extended footnote, I'm talking a thousand word plus footnote, in which he talks among other things about being the only graduate student president for, present for this address of Whitehead's. And the thing I learned in reading Kuntz's description of the event was that the Augustinian Society, about which I haven't really been able to discover much of anything, uh, was made up mostly of clergy. And given how this paper reads, that seems like a pretty significant fact because Whitehead is not kind to the church fathers in this thing. Uh, and indeed, Kuntz says that almost everyone there was furious with Whitehead by the time he had finished his talk. Um, so with that, I just wanted to make a few observations about the paper and point out a few little short quotes that particularly caught my eye. Um, I see this paper as being divided roughly into thirds. Um, the first portion is largely about the origins and nature of religious hatred. Then the middle portion is describing what Whitehead regards as sort of ideal balance in religion between either truth on one hand and value on the other, or alternatively between what he calls aesthetic versus analytic experience. And the final portion of the paper describes a sort of back and forth between these two ends of the spectrum playing out amongst the early church leaders with a kind of rigid orthodoxy eventually prevailing. Now, I have to say, as I read this thing again in preparation for this meeting, I was struck by my fairly strong reaction to it. Uh, I think that one part of the reason I had the reaction I did was just knowing the context of who Whitehead was reading this to. Uh, for instance, I was particularly struck by this quote on page three. Listen to this quote. In reading ecclesiastical history, one longs for the Athenian pagans who removed their finest moralist by the kindly device of a cup of hemlock, unquote. When I read that, my jaw sort of dropped because at that point I knew that Whitehead was saying this to a room full of clergy. And when you consider that he's sarcastically remarking here that the church fathers were actually so much worse than the guys who murdered Socrates for the crime of being impious. I mean, that's a pretty wild thing to say. I don't think I would say that to a room full of priests. Uh, so there's that, but I think really the main reason that I had such a strong reaction to this essay is that it fundamentally focused on religious hatred and religious extremism which remain very live, very problematic issues today still. And three sentences near the end on page 18 really captured this nicely for me. Quote, 
Christianity developed as a religion tainted with hatred derived from the self-confidence of analytic learning. Fanatics conceived the end of the Christian life to be adherence to the right formula. Many lapses of conduct could be condoned by adherence to a rigid orthodoxy. I found those to be genuinely upsetting lines to read simply because we're now about eight years removed from when Whitehead wrote this thing and it's not clear that we've made any progress at all in addressing these sorts of problems. Um, so anyway, that's my two cents and I'll hand it back to Brianna. Thank you, Joe. I, it's so interesting for me to hear how you interpret it. Um, the only thing I wanted to say was that when I first read this, I, I thought that so much of what Whitehead was doing was a, a prefiguration of um, you know, some of those familiar lines that we had read about uh, you know, a tender, the, the Galilean vision that in process and reality that a tender care that nothing be lost or in adventures of ideas where we have the world of activity and the world of value. But then when I looked at the date, I realized that this actually is coming after those publications. And I'm not sure what to make of, of that. And it seems as though he's trying to put it into a frame for those who haven't read his work, but um, who are, uh, who he nonetheless is trying to um, maybe offer an alternative to. And I didn't hear, Joe, you reference that alternative, but I think I, I definitely see that and hopefully we can get other people's views. Uh, what we wanted to try today was another experiment. And uh, our desire is to enable as much participation as possible while staying in one virtual room. Uh, we have considered going into breakout rooms and maybe we'll do that in the future. But as most of you probably know, there are pros and cons with that. So for the present moment, we're gonna sidestep that. When we sent you the email, we asked you a couple, uh, just made a couple prompts and bullet points. Uh, one of those were to look for sentences or ideas that reveal something to you about Whitehead's metaphysical, ethical or emotional trajectory for you. And so what I wanna do is to start off by giving everyone a chance to think about that and to actually uh, to do that task. So um, I wanted to put um, about three and a half minutes on a timer and invite all of you to uh, pick out a sentence or an idea that revealed something of Whitehead's metaphysical, ethical or emotional trajectory for you. If you're quoting a sentence, please include the page number. Now, the way that we'll do this is that um, I'm going to do what I do at a class called enter key is lava. That means it's hot and you don't touch it. Uh, so type out your idea or your sentence and just hold it until the end. And then I'll ask everyone to hit enter at the same time. Then as a group, we can start to scroll through them. And of course, you on your own can do that as well. And we'll go through several and just kind of organically see if there's some overlaps, areas of interest, common themes, and we'll be able to just use that to start our conversation. And then hopefully uh, just keep using it for um, a bit of time. And then if we need to, uh, there's another prompt that we'll uh, use for others to uh, type in again. And uh, so again, just to remind you of the prompt, uh, just take a moment. I'll put a timer on for three and a half minutes for you to choose a sentence or write out an idea that reveals something of Whitehead's metaphysical, ethical, or emotional trajectory for you. Include the page number if possible. If you have a short comment of why that stood out to you, you can add it as well. Do not hit enter until I invite you to at the end of the time and we'll join back together. All right. See you in three and a half. Let's see, Barbara is asking page number means PDF or document page number. Um, so, so, I, so I mean, because there are the document is repeated many times in different versions. So what page do you want to have? Aha, uh -huh. yes. Why don't we start with the first one? The, um, so the, the document, the, the, the page number printed in the document, not the, not the page number of the PDF. Yes. Sorry, I didn't know how to explain yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Thanks.
you'll find the prompt there in the chat now. Okay, we are at our time now. And I would invite you as you're ready to go ahead and hit enter. And we'll see our chat populate. And uh, if you're um, needing a little more time, just add on as you're ready. All right, so uh, excellent, good. What I'll do then, and again, we're experimenting, is I'm just gonna start reading out loud from these. And then after we, we get a few and we see some themes, we'll probably pause and then return to this. So from Bruce Epperly, um, the sense of an evolving multifaceted universe inviting both generality of thought and humility, not to mention a sense of our limitations in describing the universe and the holy. The world is grander than we can imagine and doctrines are always finite and subject to critique and transformation. transformation. Um, the need with Niebuhr to recognize the truth in others' falsehood and the falsehood in our own truth. From Rick Scott, thought, emotion, and activity are three aspects of the one concrete fact of human experience. Henning, uh, Brian says, brutality is the enjoyment of dominance amid servitude, where the servitude is made evident by the pain endured. Brutality can be cruelty without hatred. Let's get a couple more here. Page 14 from Raphael Reyes. Quote, the victory of love over brutality and hatred. This again realizes Whitehead's desire for harmony between aesthetics and clarification 
uh, such as logic or rationalization, which moves between romance and precision. It lures us towards adventure. It also allows us to realize that there is a movement of personal and social engagement. There is a harmonizing between the two, not privileging either, but finding intensity in the space of liminality. Uh, we'll do two more and then see what open it up for conversation. Um, Philip Gagnon says, At the, on the whole, they subordinated love to accuracy. This subordination fostered hate. It was assumed that God preferred, preferred exact verbal expressions to loving kindliness. And uh, William McClellan is saying, um, it is thought that is acting to go beyond the merely animal necessities and, affect, and affections. Whitehead is a historian, a champion of thought. And its motions are usually glacial in speed, sometimes in a flash of a few centuries. Uh, it's looking to me that we've got some, uh, certainly some of, there seems to be some like uh, engagement here with the sense of the relationship between, oh, sorry, everyone, uh, between, uh, you know, Actually, I think I'm just going to open it up. Uh, this and, and I'll let you guys pull out the themes and, and I'll just think with you. Um, do you. Remember our rules of engagement. Uh, our moderator can unmute mics. To get into the discussion queue, click on the icon that's labeled participants at the bottom center of your computer. Um, for, and uh, there should be an option at the bottom of the window that opens, which says raise hand and raising your hand that way will get you into the queue. And Brian's gonna try to get to as many hands as possible. Uh, you can also put ca uh, comments in the chat box, but just remember that right now we have a long a line of um, feedback already. So this is a great opportunity to let your voice be heard. Uh, try to uh, rain in your comments a little just so that we can get as much engagement as possible. And I'll keep time, Brian, uh, maybe for 12, 15 minutes, and then we can come back to these responses and uh, sort of read what others have written. Sounds good, Brian. So again, uh, two ways potentially to get in the queue. One is uh, to go to the bottom bar, depending on how uh, updated your Zoom is, you should have a reactions menu, which uh, may have your raise hand under reactions at the bottom. And, or you can go to, if you have an older version, go to participants. And when that window opens at the bottom of the list of participants, you may have your raise hand there. That'll just put you in the queue. Um, at the moment, I've actually made it so that you can unmute yourself um, because we're small enough. Um, I, I, unless things got out of hand, um, then, then uh, I'll, you feel free as you raise your hand um, and I call on you to, to take yourself off mute and uh, we can have a conversation. Surely this piece was provocative, I know. <laughs> so while someone is coming in, um, uh, while some hands are raising, I, I guess I just, it seems to me as we read through these first selections that there's, there's just a number of themes that I, we're seeing, right? The sense of uh, some kind of epistemic humility, um, but also the sense that orthodoxies land on real bodies. This language of brutality seems to be very visceral and um, that, that people are, are, you know, at this, the idea of uh, brutality, cruelty without hatred, that the concept of love is coming in. There seems to be here something that Whitehead keeps it conceptual, but it also seems to be really referring to how ideas land on bodies um, that you're you're drawing upon. And uh, so those are just some thoughts to get us thinking. And as we get some hands up, I'd love to hear what uh, you're deducing from your colleagues. And uh, in a while, we'll come back to these chats and start with the next ones. Ruth, feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, hi everyone. Yeah, what a fantastic uh, just collection of some of his ideas in this, in this piece. And 
one of the things I, I find when I read this and the word brutal was in fact my own response to the way he was sharing it. it, it even though it was brutal <laughs> in the way he was presenting it, he is constantly throughout um, referencing those, and Brianne mentioned it too, kind of the Galilean narratives, those little flickering beginnings, you know, the humble beginnings. In his own way, I think he's still trying to recall what's beyond some of the problems that he sees within the, you know, structured Christianity. Um, but it's interesting that he doesn't, uh, he doesn't hold back, but he's, he references throughout what's beyond the words, what's beyond ration, rationale and reason. He, I don't know, mentions poetry a lot and symbolism. So he is bringing, even though he is being very brutal in his assessment, you know, he, he, he will say, like I mentioned the quote about the, the learning divorced from experience is, is really problematic. You know, he, he references right after that, the mentioning of the gospel narrative of you know, let the little children come to me. This is this is how they, you know, this is how people approach true experience or true knowledge. So I, it's an interesting paradox that he's he's kind of doing both. When I read it, I, I saw him being both brutal and sensitive to the nature of that particular religion. Thanks for that, Ruth. I I agree with you that, if I may, I your comment reminds me of the very last paragraph. I'm curious if, if you see this as an example of that, right? He, he ends, he was intending or did end initially very negatively, crosses it out. Um, at the present moment, there's widespread relapse into the worst mixture of primitive brutality and hatred. And so this is right before World War II is, is about to commence, right? So, he, but he's pulling himself back and it couldn't, it seems like it couldn't end, allow himself to end on such a negative note. I'm curious if others, had the same reaction of trying to rein himself in at the well, end. The other thing I should point out about this is that since we know that some of these papers were being revised for possible inclusion in a book, it's actually entirely possible that he, that initial smaller paragraph was the one that he delivered. And then he was in the process of revising this at some later time, maybe even post-World War II and came up with this other paragraph. We don't actually know. There's no way for us to know. Um, yeah, that is an interesting question that he changed that last bit and, and even added that uh, I think three pages of handwritten stuff that looks like it was going to be another section following it. Um, but Ryan, can you pull it back up again? Yeah. Go ahead, Joe. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, I was actually just wondering um, uh, after Ruth's comments. Um, do you think, Ruth, that uh, did you get the sense that he was more negative than he usually is in this piece than in most of his other writings? Because that was certainly the sense that I got. Um, but I don't know, maybe it was the, the mood I was in or something. Am I crazy? No, I well, it's, it, I think there's a lot of possible perspectives here, because depending on which reading you're looking at from his science and modern world, process and reality. He's actually really harsh. And I was trying to find the specific um, spot and I have it even marked in my own readings because he, he's incredibly harsh toward Christianity and um, at, a, at a point in process and reality. He's also mentioning the roots as well in a very kind of idealistic and beautiful way. I can't find it, I can't find it right now, but I, I wasn't shocked by the way, but I, I was interested by the way he delivered it in front of clergy like this. I didn't know that in his day he would have done that. So that was that's fascinating to me. Actually, speaking of harsh, and I wanna when I get to Raphael and not keep him waiting too much longer, but speaking of that and uh, his his other work and how he could occasionally be harsh, um, there was this one quote in Religion in the Making that I was looking at and really reminded me of of this essay when I looked at it again. And uh, here it is. Good people of narrow sympathies are apt to be unfeeling and unprogressive, enjoying their egotistical goodness. Their case on a higher level is analogous to that of a man completely degraded to a hog. They have reached a state of stable goodness so far as their own interior life is concerned. This type of moral correctitude is, on a larger view, 
so like evil that the distinction is trivial. Uh, that sounds a lot like this essay, I think. I just I thought I would just read this uh, uh, quickly, um, the section that's been uh, appended at the end, written by hand. At the present moment, there is widespread relapse into the worst mixture of primitive brutality and hatred. And yet there are grounds for hope. At no time and no time, other time in the life of the Western peoples have various religious influences derived from leaders and popular response exhibited so close to likeness to the Galilee of gospel his history. Is this new spirit the last flicker of decaying religion as it fades out of human life? Or is it the first sign of a new epoch of vigorous revival? Uh, Brian, back to your moderating. Thanks for your patience, Raphael. Please uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, great to be here and in this conversation. Um, I'm looking at page four, I'll, so I'm listening. I think Ruth and um, Joseph were alluding to this idea of brutality. Um, and, and what's interesting, I think from our last reading is, you know, we always see Whitehead trying to introduce some sort of like sobering of, of reading ourselves, right? Uh, and he mentions it early on in, in this reading that we can get lost in our abstractness, right? We can get lost in the higher um, abstracted thinkings and not realize our history. And so this uh, talking of the brutality is a reminder of the history in sort of like a scientific sense. If, uh, that's how I read it, right? He, he wants to all offer some sobering language to our, to our history and, and reveal in Christianity where we haven't been so pretty ourselves. Um, and we're sort of falling into the same mistakes or patterns of narrowness and not entering into what he talks about in terms of adventure, right? Adventure of ideas. And um, so I'm, I'm including different pieces here. I might be jumping out of the critical space because um, I'm not thinking about timelines. But, but when he talks about this brutality, I see it as, well, let's look at our, 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 our Christian history um, and let's not sugarcoat it. Um, and, and see that there are areas where we've missed this aestheticness, this area of beauty, and we make our own ideas beautiful, right? A misplaced concreteness, if you will. Um, and so that's why he's always going back and forth with um, the subjective and then the bigger sphere of the sociological. He jumps on that in page 20. And so I, as I'm reading it, I'm seeing, yeah, he's rough on, uh, on, on Christian history and the Christian spaces because he doesn't want us to fall into the space of misplaced concreteness um, and say, we're, we're missing that picture, that Galilean image, that, that Galilean beauty aesthetics that we need to navigate back to um, and question ourselves. Um, and, and, and so th that, that's what I'm seeing. I just wanted to, to share that as I'm listening to Ruth and, and Joseph on that brutality. I think he's also being honest um, and trying to use some quote unquote, maybe scientific language, which is sort of like maybe dull or dry, um, but allows us to see something so that when we enter into the more feeling aesthetic space, it's a realization and some form of novelty that we can correct ourselves, right? Um, and maybe and maybe overcome that that uh, narrowness or that uh, that precision with that romance uh, that he that he talks about, right? Um, and, and stuff like that. So that's all I wanted to say for now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rafael. Uh, that was really useful. Paula, please. Uh, what are you thinking? Um, thank you, Brian, for. Uh, this opportunity to share again in this uh, reflection. And I must say that uh, this text pushed me to further research because I was asking myself the question, but why should Whitehead be this hard? I don't think I have read any of his texts in which I found him so hard like he was towards Christianity in particular. 
and uh, is uh, the text makes a subtle distinction between brutality and hatred. And I think he emphasized on this on page seven, where he notes that hatred is a high grade feeling, the product of civilization. So brutality seems for him to be quite a natural uh, attitude, but hatred comes with civilization. So um, I think he makes that distinction, but why was he doing this? And uh, talking to Augustinians, to Catholic priests in 1939, pushed me to ask final, but what was going on in the church in the 1930s? And if we look into the history of the church in the 1930s, we find very interesting things happening with the rise of communism, which was like getting hold of the world. Um, uh, and with the, with, with the church, seeing it like uh, seeing communism as a threat to its existence, the church was undergoing so many transformations. So many things were happening in the church. That was right before Vatican II Council. And uh, we noticed that it was in the 1930s, 1940s, that we start finding the first, the first church documents on the social and teachings of, we start having social, social documents on the, on the social teachings of the church, of the Catholic church. And I think it, it was a reaction to these teachings that Whitehead was like talking about when he was in these in these lectures. I want to have that in the background while I, re, I look where we examine this text. I think he was like, putting the Catholics on a guard that, oh yes, you are developing a, a, a social teaching, but be careful that in developing these teachings, you shouldn't develop more hatred, which um, religion or um, Christianity has already brought. And it is quite true that uh, with the rise of Christianity and the different, the, how Christianity has evolved, the sense of hatred or the sense, the distinction between good and evil is, uh, is like the foundation itself of Christianity. You must know the good is uh, what is accepted and the evil is what should be rejected. Definitely in such a, a context, hatred is bound to arise. And I think um, it is from this perspective too, we need to, uh, from this perspective that he, he, he emphasizes the, uh, the difference between brutality and hatred and uh, he's pushing forward a certain moral, a moral teaching, which for him, um, we need to take things into consideration before defining um, uh, church doctrines or issues like that. Thank you. Thanks, Fala. Could you uh, point us to again, the uh, passage, so we're all looking at the right one. I think you said uh, it was the numbered page seven or eight. Is that where you were referencing? Yes, seven, eight. Um, hatred is a higher grade, grade feeling, the product of civilization. That should be on page eight. Okay, let me sh just quickly share that before I take uh, the next, I think. Um, Six, I think. Is that, oh, are you referring to the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. Are you referring to the PDF the first... page numbers or the... I'm talking about the printed page numbers. On six, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's the bottom of the page. Ah, thank you, okay, very good. So yes. this passage here, um, this relates to an interesting, I mean, in, in Adventures of Ideas, civilization is usually the term he would use, and we find this in the last piece we read too, usually the term he uses in, in, to suggest progress and, and the, the highest ideal, and there's been question rightly about whether or not his Victorian English sort of uh, colonial attitudes are coming through in this use of civilization. Um, Claire Palmer wrote an essay years ago uh, on this topic. And I think there's some things that are fair about that and some things that are, he's again using civilization sometimes in a, in a technical way that would um, avoid the criticisms. And other times I think he's, he's subject to the criticisms rather, rather fairly. But this one, when you pointed it, I, I missed it when I first read it because um, this is unusual for him uh, to, to pair, if civilization is usually the ideal, the aim of, uh, that, toward which we're, we're moving, uh, to pair it with hatred, 
is 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 a little confusing um, in in that way. So thanks for pointing out that that passage. It's an odd one in the way that he usually uses civilization. And actually, if you could scroll down one more page um, onto uh, hatred in the vicious sense of the term, that paragraph there, um, and a little little further down as well. Um, I saw in the chat that I think about five of us had grabbed bits of this passage, including myself. And uh, I really sort of liked this definition of, of hatred. And part of the reason I like it is that it includes a kind of stupidity as a constitutive part of it, or a lack of empathy and understanding. Um, and it says that uh, hatred arises when limited intelligence perceives antagonism without recognition of its own limitations. Um, the other interesting thing is going on to the next paragraph, which he says, when this recognition of limitation is present, vicious hatred is reduced to repulsion. Um, Self-preservation of the excellencies of a form of life repels factors which are inconsistent with it, which when you think about it, that sentence there about self-preservation, he's actually sort of just describing the maintenance of a society of actual occasions, like a serially ordered society, but he's chosen this more emotionally charged word and it's a whole different context. Um, so he's really, I guess, bringing his philosophy more to the to the people um, or just making it more accessible, I think, which it's someone I think maybe Ruth had said before. Um, anyway, just some stray thoughts. Excellent. Um, I'm gonna stop um, sharing because I've got too many windows on. Go ahead, Brienne. Yeah, I just was gonna just um, go back to our uh, queue and read a few more and then we can um, just keep on with those who have their hands up. Does that sound all right? Yes, yes, it does. Uh, so just to remind everybody, if you if you have a question, um, feel free to raise your hand and get in the queue. We've got Barbara and Richard uh, in that queue and, and Brian's gonna, oh, and Dan, you're trying to, okay. <laughs> I, I thought I saw you put your hand up, but I wasn't sure. Uh, so we'll, we'll, ca we'll call that an audible there. He's having trouble <laughs> digitally raising his hand. Um, okay, good, okay. I'll just come back to the chat. We're starting with Miha Flair who gives us from page 13, when learning overwhelms the variety of aesthetic enjoyments, life becomes futile. And Richard Kuhl on page seven, in other words, hatred arises when limited intelligence perceives antagonism without recognition of its own limitations. Joe just read this. And on page 11, the weakness of science and of religion purified by scientific method is the phase of dogmatic self-satisfaction. Um, I think you just touched on this, uh, Joe, so I'm going to pass by. And uh, Stephanie says, the brutality is a survival from the primitive level of animal life. Uh, yeah, Stephanie, I really want to talk about Whitehead's uh, constantly perplexing view of uh, animals. Um, and last one we'll do for now, Thomas Royce, hatred... Ah, here we go. This is exactly what, uh, what we just talked about, that hatred is a high-grade feeling, the product of civilization. In the origins of civilized life, it, in Sorry? it intensifies brutality by introducing an intellectual justification. The gods of primitive civilization exhibit brutality intensified by hatred. The result is the boastful exaltation of horrid power enjoyed alike by kings, despots, and gods. Over to you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. I, I think this is a fun method. I might have to steal this from my class. Um, so I, I noticed Dan waving a little while ago. Because uh, uh, is Barbara, would it be okay with you if I took a wave? Are, is, are you okay with that? And then um, I think I saw Bruce just a minute ago. Bruce, do you want to be at the in, in the queue as well? I'm looking for your picture now, Bruce, and I'm not seeing it. Um, actually left he said in the chat oh to... oh he was saying goodbye ah okay all right so we'll go dan barbara and then richard uh dan go ahead okay thanks um uh i was struck by the uh, biblical quote on page four printed page four um it says let both grow together until the harvest and um, and it led me to think about uh the difference between pre-liberal political philosophy and liberal political philosophy. So, so I take it that in pre-liberal political philosophy, 
the goal was to find out the good and the definite article is needed there and to get power get, to get those who understood the good into power and to be replaced by people who understood the good and to weed out heresy in other words people who did not understand the good um, and this led to all kinds of disastrous results um, I take it that Whitehead, as a political liberal, was perfectly at home with diversity of opinion and competing conceptions of the good and had no desire whatsoever to persecute people who happened to have a different conception of the good life from the one that he had. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm just seeing Whitehead here as a quintessential political liberal, right, uh, uh, who notices the problems with pre-liberal political philosophy. Further, it strikes me that if this was written in 1939, when I first started reading this, I did not know when it was written, but now that I know it was you know, written and delivered in 1939, it's very interesting that Whitehead is confronting the possibility of post-liberal political orders you know, taking over and how frightening that must have been, both um, a, a version of post-liberalism from the right but then also from the left, remember the Soviet Union was the ally of Nazi Germany at this point. Um, uh, they had not yet, you know, <laughs> Hitler had not attacked Russia at this point. So it was, you know, the, uh, the, the, the dangers of a post-liberal order from both the right and the left uh, must have been ominous at this particular point in history. And also, I have to confess it in my own mind today, um, uh, that there are problems with liberalism, uh, obviously, but... Um, there are also some scary possibilities, uh, you know, when one considers, uh, you know, post-liberal positions uh, from the right and the left. I, I, here in the United States, we're very much familiar with the danger from the right and Trumpism. Um, but I also, in my university, uh, I'm a bit skittish about the cancel culture stuff from the left. <laughs> um, but Whitehead was willing to let both uh, or let all the different views grow together until the harvest. I don't know what the harvest is. Maybe the harvest is long-term objective truth that is not yet within our grasp. I don't think he believes in some sort of eschatological end of history sort of harvest, but uh, uh, some, some sort of resolution of differences and closer approximation to the truth. Maybe that's what he means by the harvest. Thanks for your patience. I'm, I'm glad you were we're waving and thank you, Barbara, for your, your patience and grace in letting us uh, stick him into the queue there. Feel, feel free to, to chime in. Thank you, no worries. Um, um, I mean, I, I just was going on in the same direction of the distinction between brutality and hatred, which I think is something that really needs more attention. Uh, I, I was searching for, but I'm not finding it so quickly, the passages at the end of Adventures of Ideas where he talks, he is pretty harsh on morality as well and talks about morality and evil. And I think this would be interesting really to bring these two parts together. What I find, I, I wonder, but this probably doesn't work, but you could, I, and I'm, it's a question that I'm asking, whether you could consider that brutality in some kind of way is closer to the aesthetic as, as a way of, you know, as it's negative, because everything has its negative if it is too much of it, right? Whether hatred is more on the side of the analytic. I don't know whether this works, which just crossed my mind while I was reading this, um, and how both come together in, the, in, in 1939, which I find um, quite interesting um, to, uh, to articulate. Um, the, the point about civilization doesn't surprise me much, because I think in Adventures of Ideas, but also in Function of Reason, Civilization is not always only the big, the big goal, right? Um, it goes through bumps and these bumps throw it backwards. So I, in a way, it's not something surprise. I'm also less surprised by what you consider his to harsh tone because this maybe with more British elegance, this tone is present in other pieces, but the British elegance covers it in a kind of softer, softer framework of irony, but it's quite harsh if you read some of the passages. These are the two things. And I, just the last quick thought that I have, I think this piece is really interesting. There is one thing that worries me given the context um, 
and I, because he's still a British white guy, right? <laughs> and it is the point about the distinction between Northern Europe and Southern Europe and Africa um, when he talks about Augustine and he's talking about that um, analytic thrive that goes all the way um, to hatred coming from Southern Europe and Africa. So there is that kind of story that I find a little problematic, but um, otherwise it's really a great, great text. Thank you. Uh, Brian, I wanted to just jump in here. I think there are a number of places where morality is uh, touched upon, but just to uh, stitch together the last two comments, I thought this passage here on the bottom of three, the moral dangers attendant upon the intensification of moral feeling have not been sufficiently explored. Highly intellectual people are peculiarly liable to attacks of hatred when their moral natures have reached an excitable level. And I just thought there was something extremely timely about this uh, to your point, Dan, and um, that this, uh, you know, that there's this possibility that moral feeling, and I'm thinking here is if it's uh, to the degree it uh, emulates a kind of, uh, the ultimate occasion, right? The, the occasion without limits can be productive, but that there's this uh, sense that moral feeling can also be extremely, well, dangerous here or, you know, dangerously exclusionary. And it, boy, that feels very timely for our present moment. All right, back to you, Richard. Actually, before, um... Sorry, Richard, just one, if I might, just one one more uh, on this, because it really is a, a, a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, so we've been referencing Adventures of Ideas, and these are two passages that occur to me from the end of, of Adventures of Ideas. Uh, this is a topic that I like to think and write a, a lot about. He's really consistent throughout his writings to be against um, moral codification, um, Moral codes are useful for the time period and the environment and for which they're designed and they serve a function and then they become an impediment and a problem when they're ossified and codified and, they, and, and beyond the point at which they're still useful, right? They're seen as being permanent. And so I love these passages when he's talking about the respectable amoebae, right? That's pretty, that's pretty harsh. I mean, he's throwing shade there, right? I love that passage. Um, and here he's a little bit softer but he's, but not that much, right? Um, low tone moralists, right? I mean, so uh, and the other thing I would note just in terms of a trajectory in time is that uh, in 1931, 32, he was the president of the American Philosophical Association and delivered uh, the Eastern APA presidential address, objects and subjects. And at that point was the depths of uh, the depression. And I wrote an essay years ago pointing out that you, you wouldn't know from his address uh, what was going on in the world. It was completely, it, it's the essay that's now in Adventures of Ideas published in, in, in 1933, the chapter on objects and subjects is from his, pres is his presidential address. Whereas other APA presidents in that decade of 1930s uh, were, were focusing on uh, the intellectual fight that was going on, uh, to go back to Dan's comment, uh, globally, um, and that we're marshalling different philosophical resources to, to um, wage this fight. Um, and what I guess I'm suggesting is I didn't see it in 1931-32. I was wishing I had, but we do see it in this piece in 1939, where he's, he's entering the philosophical fray over this fight of ideas that were going on um, with, with Germany and Russia, United States, Europe. Uh, and so I was glad to see him um, doing what I'd wished he had done at the APA uh, years earlier. Sorry, I'm abusing my moderator privileges. Richard, please. Well, how fun. I, I'm someone who's actually studied amoeba uh, and amoeba-like creatures a lot, and I had no idea that Whitehead would have given a nod to that extraordinary group of organisms. So I'm going to go back to get my old copy of Adventures uh, of Ideas and find that. I don't remember that at all. And I just would like to say that I'm, I'm so appreciative to all of you and to the organizers for putting this together. I was first introduced to Whitehead as a 19 year old at the University of New Hampshire, University of New Hampshire by uh, Professor Duane Whittier, who let me as a science undergrad step into his graduate level seminar 
on process and reality. It changed my life utterly. And in his 80s and in my 50s, I wrote to Professor Whittier and told him that I could remember every paper I wrote for him and every book I read for him and how Whitehead has been a, a, a presence on my shoulder. Even though I've not delved into his world in a, um, in a professional way, um, he comes into my teaching and and so to be able to wander into this is just so special. To read this essay was unbelievably special. Not only was it approachable, which not everything that Whitehead writes is approachable, it was very much speaking to our time. And that was, you know, when you guys found this, you must have been knocked out because it is very much speaking to our time. And the, the date of it, you know, when you mentioned that uh, earlier, Brian, uh, I was reminded immediately of Sir Michael Tippett, the English composer, um, who wrote a, an oratorio that started in 1939 called The Child of Our Times. And it's a, it, it has a metaphor of cancer as he musically tries to talk about the, the spread of fascism in Europe and the darkness of the, of the time. And Whitehead is talking about darkness in some ways. Um, Tippett lightens that darkness by bringing in American Negro spirituals to lightness. It's an amazing oratorio written around the time that Whitehead would have been with these words. My, my comments about the essay was, um, he was hard on Christianity, but to me, he wasn't really talking about theology. He was talking about the bifurcations. Uh, he was using something that it, it also just reminded me of James Carroll's huge book called Constantine's Sword, which looks at these bifurcation points in Christianity in the context of its relationship to women, in the context of relationship to Judaism, and it's in, con in context to, to um, democracy. Because at, at the time, what someone was mentioned, uh, 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 Fala was mentioning that time in the 30s and 40s, where was Christendom, where was Catholicism really? Well, Catholicism sought, you know, they called it Americanism, not democracy, and it was a problem to be dealt with. So I really see this bifurcation thing as he wasn't theo White wasn't talking theologically. He's talking about the human practice of, of making choices and these choices that are of the things that he was really the outcome of the choices, the outcome that led to hatred rather than love and, and, and repulsion rather than acceptance are the kinds of things that he was talking about the human condition in that sense, much less than on the religion per se, I think. Anyways, my two cents. Thanks so much, Richard. That's a, that's a great story too. Uh, Brian, shall I go back to the queue? The chat? That seems like, a, seems like a good idea. Okay, I'm gonna start here. Uh, I just went through and saw some people have already spoken. So I'm gonna go down to Valerian. Uh, Hatred arises when limited intelligence perceives antagonism without recognition of its own limitations. Um, a helpful uh, reiteration there. Um, and Olusegun says, in this respect, the importance of an idea is that it should purify emotion. And the importance of emotion is that it should vivify ideas. Page nine, I actually would like to return to that idea. Um, and uh, Ruth here is just again talking about verbal le learning divorced from direct experience is the perpetual danger of civilization. Shang Ping, page five. Thus the history of Western religions is to be understood in terms of four characterizations, namely vivid moral feelings liable to pass into hatred, the survival of ancestral brutality, the sense of priceless value, and the sense of finality of understanding, respecting definite objectives. The delicate beauty of the religious life is derived from the sense of value and understanding. That really seems like there's something to pull apart there as well, actually. Um, these four characterizations. And I'm wondering if there might be a connection with um, um, Olesegun's uh, quote here of this you know, this kind of bringing, uh, this mutual reflection of emotion and idea. So I think, and then I'll just get Jessica, Jessica Brown's here as well. The truly religious use of formula as one subordinate means of stimulating delicacies of emotion inspiring purpose was thrust into the background. 
the, I'm going to read it again. The truly religious use of formula as one subordinate means of stimulating delicacies of emotion, inspiring purpose was thrust into the background. Uh, Jessica, I wonder if you might just start us off here with uh, why this particular quote uh, grabbed your attention and what thought it's produced for you. Hey, um, I'm thinking of the very first, just to connect it to the very first comment you read. Oops. I thought that said it. Um, not uh, from Bruce, who said the harmony. Um, uh, this kind of achieves a little place of harmony between value and truth and the aesthetic or poetic and the analytic, which is there's not there's a function for both. And it seems that Whitehead puts re really beautifully here and kind of in an exciting way, what the function of the formula, the, the hard language that kind of tries to put package everything really well. It's not that it's not useful, but that it's but that it's um, circumspect, that it's that it's inspirational rather than um, rather than organizational. I I think I yeah. was yeah I was um, pleased that he landed that he brought that that he kind of landed that. Um, it's not in the sense that it kind of it gives a place for both to function, but but it really does outline. It really does give that kind of formula, um, the analytic, the truth, a very circumspect position, but it's still life giving. Mm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Brian, back to you. So I think I can see everybody's tile. If and if you're having trouble raising your hand do one of these and I'll, I'll go old school. So I can, I'm happy to call on you that way as well if you've got your video on or put question in the chat would be uh, perfectly fine as well. Um, I will. I might, Joe, I, yeah, actually I was just gonna ask you Joe, um, one thing we could do is also talk about where this is gonna appear in critical edition uh, before, we, before we wrap up just to, give people an orientation about, about where this is gonna land in, in the corpus. But go ahead, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I was just gonna say that um, kind of going off that, talking about how he has these sort of um, kind of pairs of, of dual concepts. And uh, one of them is this um, uh, analytic versus um, emotional idea. Um, where is this? I guess I'm looking on page 12. Um, and Whitehead kind of likes having these pairings that sort of require each other or suggest each other and, and yet are sort of intention a little bit. Um, things like permanence and flux um, or God in the world. And um, so here he has these two modes that are sort of intention and it's the analytic coordination and then the aesthetic um, uh, experience. And I thought it was really interesting on page 12 that normally he wouldn't subordinate one to the other. He would just say they both require each other. Um, but here he, he shows a preference for the aesthetic mode. He says, if this definition of the ideal aim be accepted, it is obvious that the aesthetic mode of development of experience in, involving fortunate interplay of emotion and idea represents the dominant objective the second mode of analytic coordination, which includes a science, includes science and the pursuit of analytic understanding is a secondary procedure with its justification and its services to the former mode. Um, so I just thought it was interesting that, that he did that. And this, this is pretty consistent with, with what we have from in an adventures of ideas in that he is clear that, you know, um, reality is good when it's beautiful and he's pretty consistent about, about seeing the aesthetic and beauty uh, being more fundamental than truth or goodness, which is unusual, right, for a, a position, but he, um, I yeah. think, is, is really consistent and, and clear about that. And so I was glad to, to see that, that here. So he's for an ideal aim and he's against moral codes, at least as anything other than a, um, a useful guide for a period, but that beauty 
is for him seems to go further than than even you know than evil or emotion or those other other things. Yes, Would you agree? Said before that um, that uh, ethics is subservient to or derivative from aesthetics. Um, right. Said that in like the Harvard lectures, um, for instance. Oh. Well, and in religion in the making, and yeah, yeah. yeah William, please. Thank you. Um, I wonder if Whitehead, it, it seems to me I haven't heard in Whitehead so much that he elaborates the notion, which is a parallel, the other side of the notion that life is robbery, which is life is gift. The mere occasion is satisfied to find its place and do its thing. And as the society in which it finds itself is more elaborate, eventually comes subjectivity. And then a subjectivity of myself to myselfness becomes elaborated and becomes part of a strain of presiding occasions that becomes problematic to give your gift. And so the tooth maybe of the mole upon the worm, is the worm satisfied saying, ah, I'm donating to a higher form or the <laughs> diatom to the krill, you know? And as subjectivity increases, the possibility of being misunderstood. I will, I'll give myself, but I'm not sure you understand my feeling for the purpose, you know? And then, and we have human artifacts talking about this kind of exchange when say Native Americans offer a gift or a prayer and an animal comes and offers itself to the hunter. So, and the notion of sacrifice, I, it, it's an underexplored element and we all want to have, uh, feel our purpose is fulfilled in something greater. And in human life, the people who've understood being misunderstood the most have a lot to teach us maybe about how to feel satisfied with I still love my country even though they've kicked me in the teeth and killed my parents and my children. And uh, I, I just want to say gift as a theme to think about, that's all, thank you. Brutality is, is of the essence, but we want to give ourselves to something greater and be included. We find this in music, we give ourselves freely in music and mysticism also is like, you could say, has a, you could say a sexual notion, of, it's a little death, we die, you cannot die. You cannot go on and be part of the one unless you die. And people seek that death. So there's something to be uh, celebrated in giving oneself to the whole. And I'm not saying, yeah, okay, I think you see what I'm saying. I just... Thank you, William, oh, that was really interesting. I imagine Brian can jump off of that. Um, well, I just was actually thinking about two of the, the last essays of Whitehead's life, which are uh, Mathematics and the Good and uh, Immortality. And I had not um, heard about those until I was uh, trying to write my dissertation. And they really helped bring a, a number of things together for me. They were written, I think, Joe, the date I have is 1948, but I think he died in 1947. They were published in the Library of Living Philosophers volume by Schilp. And yeah, I, my understanding was that he was, they were written, they were written and then he offered them as his response in that volume. Normally a, a philosopher would write something um, as a response to all the essays, but he says in the letter in the volume, I'm too old to do that. So here are two recent essays. So it would have been in the period slightly before I believe uh, it was publication. Uh, I, I, 41. I could be wrong, but I think it's 41. Yeah. Okay. So it would have been after this because, um, yeah. So those two essays, Mathematics and the Good and Immortality, um, they were really helpful for me because they, um, they were one of the places where it seemed that Whitehead was really very, uh, he was paralleling um, some concepts in um, Asian and Indian thought. And uh, where he's, to, to Joe's point, where he's trying to stitch these um, kind of opposing ideas together. And in those, in, um, at that point, he refers to it, the world of activity and the world of value. And what I thought was interesting about 
to me, uh, when I think through the lens of Indian philosophies, when you have these mutually requiring um, kind of dialectics, it, it functions often as an ethical lure, right? There's maybe the conventional and the ultimate perspective. The ultimate is the unlimited. And we can think in Whitehead that this is the world of value, right? This is the world unobstructed. This is the, uh, the tender care that nothing be lost. Everything that has happened, that could have happened, but didn't, that might have happened, exists in this kind of virtual occasion. Sometimes Whitehead calls it God, sometimes the Korah, sometimes the receptacle, right? The holder of the occasion in which nothing has to be excluded. And then that's this lure that the world of activity that every little occasion is kind of striving in its own way toward that, right? And so this to me becomes kind of Whitehead's ethics. And I've, I've written about this a lot in a kind of cross perspective of, of Whitehead and uh, Jainism, but it makes me think of this idea, the, the quote that was referenced earlier about repulsion. I remember a class with Roland Faber where he, he kind of drew on the board this vector, right? And he said that, you know, an occasion comes into being by what it accepts and by what it repels, right? Uh, he didn't use the word repel, but I'm using that because of the quote. And it, I'm wondering if this, this idea of, you know, the selection, um, the exclusion, uh, this is a part of what makes an occasion an occasion, right? It can't take in everything or else it would be the world of value. It would be the ultimate occasion. So every occasion is defined by what it accepts and by what it repels. But the point that's being made here in the passage that you read earlier was that the re repulsion doesn't have to be brutality, right? Repulsion doesn't have to be cruel. Um, yet there is this lure toward less and less repulsion, right? Less and less exclusion. And it seems to me that there's, that this holding together these two components of the world of activity and the world of value, or as he refers here, the analytic and the aesthetic, that he just keeps developing this idea. And that to me, I think it's an idea that, you know, maybe was unfootnoted uh, as a, maybe a reference toward uh, Asian or Indian philosophies. It's hard to know that sometimes he does refer to them. Um, but that's also the that's the, the kind of moral impetus is how does the occasion, which by its nature has to exclude or repel, uh, strive toward the ultimate occasion or the world of value of which has no obstruction, right? It's, a, it's actually, a, it can't be material because it is uh, anything that is material or embodied would it can't take in everything. If you and I tried to take in everything, we'd explode, right? We'd be thrown or broke as Bernard Loomer says. But uh, that there's a real moral push here um, that is uh, I think really significant to uh, Whitehead's uh, ethical orientation. Well said, I'm deeply sympathetic to that view as you know. Barbara. Yes, thank you. I I like this, I, I find sometimes that too much, there's too much harmony in that. So I think one of the reasons why the aesthetic is superior to the moral and to the truth is because it can bear contradiction. It doesn't have to solve them. It can hold them together, it can inhabit them. Um, and, and I think, I don't know, I, I probably read Whited less, in, 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 in this, less in this harmonious way, but I, you know, again, you can push him in one direction or the other, but I think this is important. Uh, so this way, I'm not sure this is a moral, this way, it's not necessarily a moral, right? Because morality is rooted in the, in the idea of exclusion because good excludes evil fundamentally. And this is why the aesthetic order is superior because it doesn't have to exclude. It's still within the finite, within limitation, but there are ways in which to canalization things can be held together in their contradictory uh, dimensions, right? So I don't know whether that makes sense. 
it's a, it's a, I'm not sure if I completely understand you, Barbara, or not, but, but I, I think I agree with you. I mean, he's clear that uh, tragedy and conflict discord uh, is, is a necessary part of intense experience. So that harmony is the, the, the important but weaker form of beauty. And we, we need to not merely have harmony, but also intensity uh, that, that peace is, you know, is not the absence of, of conflicts for him. So tragedy, discord, I put a passage in the chat, each tragedy is the disclosure of an ideal. What might've been was not what can be. The tragedy was not in vain. The survival power and motive force by reason of appeal to re reserves of beauty marks the difference between the tragic evil and the gross evil, which kind of sounds similar to brutality versus, right? He's got a sort of a, a similar thing going on. The inner feeling belonging to this grasp of the service of tragedy is peace, right? So we have similar themes that are similar, written in a similar uh, time. Uh, it's hard though to swallow those, those passages about discord and about um, the justification of, of destruction and violence as worth it to, or, or as, ne as necessary. I mean, not just that the, the reality is necessarily ends or set at odds, but um, he almost says there's something good about it, which is, which um, anyway, there, I, I think there's a lot of conversation to be had there, but I'll follow up. Um, thank you. I am not reacting to to the moral morality or aesthetic part, but I have a question for William. When he talks of gift, um, I, I, is he making a relation to brutality as that gift? As uh, is should should we understand brutality as some sort of gift, self sacrificing? Is that I don't I don't know if he is in that direction which he. May I respond quickly? Of course. Thank you. I was characterizing it in its simplest possible way to stand against uh, the notion of life as robbery. Robbery versus gift. Does a krill rob from a diatom? Maybe, maybe not, but there's a satisfaction involved in the, in the whole scheme of things. The whole, Whitehead's whole scheme is towards the elaboration of more complex societies. At a certain point, as subjectivity gets more involved in the complex in the society that is complex, it's, it's, the, the Native Americans would understand, at least in some stories of some Native Americans, I, you know, not that I know a thing about that particularly, but what I've read. They, they would offer a, a, an offering of uh, the hunter would offer his offering that the, the deer or antelope would appear as a gift. Thank you, brother, for offering yourself. And the note and in religious also, we put a, a, a gift on the altar. I don't want to say, you know, thank, thank you, German Jews, for giving yourself to civilization. I'm not going there. <laughs> no, no, sir. Uh, no, so it's a tip. It's it's a typology for the purposes of this conversation only to set up statistics. Kind of just. I I believe you. I think you understand me. Thank you. Thank Good you. question. So I think we have time for maybe one more short round. I realize I. I booked a meeting at 1030 and then, and then I've, <laughs> I'm, I'm hosting the, the Zoom. So I can, actually can't, I'm, I don't know, maybe I could try and transfer the host and see if that works, but uh, <laughs> we'll probably wrap up the next three or four minutes. Brian? Yeah, I just, I mean, on, on that point of, uh, I feel there's like, there's this message in the Quaker, you know, not to cross talk. So I, it's hard to know, like I've, I should, I'm and just prompted by, by this conversation of the idea of sacrifice. And I think this sense that, you know, the, it's a, it's a, this is in P, uh, PR, um, that, it's a, a, a truth that life is robbery, but the, the quote is something like, but there's no metaphysical necessity why this is the whole story, right? So it's a kind of the question of the emphasis, right? Is the, the dipolarity of the actual occasion is, is that folding in of the, um, of the lure, right? That, uh, and it isn't to say, yes, we hold everything in a kind of harmony of, 
uh, it's a it's a dissonant harmony. It's to say how much more can you uh, include? How, you know, can you make a step toward less exclusion? And so I think to that point of sacrifice, it's to say that the the movement envisioned here is one of which in which uh, sacrifice becomes less and less. Right, that the cost, while robbery seems to be unavoidable within our material reality. There's no metaphysical reason why that has to be the whole story. So it's how do you fold this virtual possibility space that can hold everything in contrast? Um, how do you fold that in or uh, embody it? Uh, how do you uh, incarnate in the small ways, less sacrifice, right? Less uh, exclusion, less repulsion. That this seems to be the, um, kind of the aesthetic ethic is one of expansion, though not necessarily, uh, right? A, a piece, a piece here isn't uh, passive. It is a sense of, can we accept more contrast without being exploded, right? And it's that little, uh, you know, towardness, I think. Thanks, Brian. So Ruth, uh, I'm gonna give you our last comment before we wrap. Oh, hi. I just actually had a question um, for, I'm not sure who, possibly Joe um, or Brian or Brian, um, about the handwritten ending to this piece. Is this something that was included as part of the talk? And I'm sorry if this is a silly question, but are these notes after the fact? Are these additions to that, to that um, sharing that he did? I just wanted to know if anyone knows. Yeah, so there's no way to know all of that for sure. Um, but I have a feeling that because of the way that he's titled um, that, that top portion, he's retitled the essay with a, a Roman numeral one at the start. And then he has that handwritten portion as number two. I, have, I suspect that what was happening there was that he delivered the typed portion as, as written. And then that handwritten stuff was written some time after the fact, and he was going to turn it into um, a new book or a new series of essays that we know nothing about that never came to be. And, um, you know, we really can't know when he wrote that because just no one knows any longer. Um, but I, I think that's probably the best explanation. I agree with Joe. Um, we have other essays where he's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, I think he scribbles out a title and says, you know, and writes in a new title. Yeah. And the new one is the one that will appear in, in print. Um, I would say though that it seems plausible that some of the bubbles along the way, the bubble sort of insertions very well could have been um, changes that he made because he would also, we also have examples of him making yes. modifications to things that he delivered orally that he was correcting. So it's plausible that this is a mixture of both, um, that the some of the interpolations along the way were, were delivered but that I agree with Joe, it seems more likely that we're not sure that what we have at the end and the top are probably his intended modifications for, for print um, as, as most likely. And that's a good place to stop because I also wanted to mention, um, you know, this will eventually be, uh, it's been transcribed and, and it, it will be uh, edited and included probably in uh, one of the two volumes of collected papers that we're intending to publish. So we've, we've published Harvard Lectures one and two we're transitioning and we're gonna pause on the Harvard lectures for a little bit and we're gonna to transition to publishing two volumes of collected papers, which is a mixture of things that were, um, that were, that were not, never published, well, that were like these things that were never published. Um, and much of it though is actually materials that were published, uh, but not necessarily, um, how do we put it, Joe? Not necessarily- Widely available. What, yeah, widely available. So yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll share more as, as that those table of contents um, uh, become more firm, but that'll be just uh, dividing his first half of his papers and second, but that'll um, chronologically. So uh, that's what will be coming next. Um, but there's a ton of math and logic and we've got a ton of uh, verification of transcription to do. So that'll take us a little while. So feel free to go to Whitehead Research pro uh, uh, Project and uh, donate to the critical edition so we can hire student transcriptionists uh, as you're able. 
thanks again to Brian for uh, having the idea to bring us together. I think this has been a lot of fun. And uh, so I'm thank you for joining us. We have another session. If you want to share that slide, uh, Brian, uh, our next session. It'll be March 12th. And okay. uh, look for an email for us in the next week, which will just, uh, you can go to uh, Whitehead Research Project, find our date and the reading will be there. And also we'll send out a reminder in the next week that'll have a couple question prompts and um, the reading as well. So we'll see you in three weeks, Friday. Hope you can join. Um, same time, uh, watch this space. See you guys, thanks so much. And the recording of this will appear on the page for this session. Joe will, will post it later. So that's where you can find that. Thanks again, everybody. Be well.